Thank you so much. The Michael University College in association with the Marcus Garvey Institute presenting two conversations, October 15 to 18. Garvey's experience, the power of education, education of the African child. Partners, uh, Jamaica Pegasus or Strictly Woods. All right, so this is going to be online, an online uh, event, Professor Hutton. Yes. Right. Um, so, we, so we're online because we're not seeing where. We, we are going to very shortly, uh, people know. All right, so and you let us know. We, we tell our listeners. So October 15 yes. to 18. Thank you so much, Prof. Uh, yes. All right, Professor uh, Clinton Hutton there. Just to let you know, the Micro University College in association with the Marcus Garvey Institute presenting... Two conversations. Garvey's experience, the power of education, and education of the African child. Meet with us online from October 15 to 18, 2020. So you'll hear how to meet online uh, shortly. But just keep those dates in mind. We remind you that today the mental health um, forum is happening also online. All right, I'll tell you a little bit more about that in a while. Let's do this. Only Optical Elements has the latest technology lenses and frames to suit your taste and budget. Visit us at 67 Halfway Tree Road, online at OpticalElementsJA.com or call 929-8284. Optical Elements, vision in style. The time by Optical Elements is... Now, five minutes after 8 o'clock, you're inside of the Africa Forum. It is Running African, Caribbean Progressive Perspectives, and Atlanta Collective for Radical Education and Studies, inviting you to a live Zoom webinar. The theme is Mental Health Insights, the Caribbean in the Era of COVID. Professor uh, Dr. Lakim Samaj, a quantum transformation psychologist, chief ideator, and uh, resultant international keynote and motivational speaker, will be presenting today on managing psychological trauma and unemployment. Also presenting uh, Imo Bakari, who is a lecturer in psychology at the University of Southern Caribbean, um, Maracas, Trinidad, and the topic, uh, funda- the fundamentals of mental health. Also presenting Kenneth uh, Col- uh, Covale, president of the foundation The Quill, St. Eustatius, uh, Stress and Healthy Living. Also presenting Dr. Khatija Khan. Co- Dr. Khan is a clinical psychologist and neuropsychologist in the Faculty of Medical Sciences at UWE Trinidad. will be presenting on navigating and adjusting to the new normal. So that's happening today, Sunday, October 11. Five p- four o'clock Jamaica time. The meeting ID is uh, to get your pen. The meeting ID is eight seven three one zero six four four two four eight. That's eight seven three one zero six four four two four eight. And the password is Mind Health. Mind Health. All uppercase now. M I N D H E A L T H. So that's happening today and then oh okay i can talk to professor shepherd about what's happening tomorrow so let's go to the phone lines where my sister uh is standing by professor Verine shepherd director of the center for reparation research at the university of the west indies mona good morning prof good morning good morning to you and all your listeners how are you very well so far okay <laughs> right. Um, we were supposed to be co-hosting this morning. As, I know. But, yes. You know, the ancestors said not today. Right, not today, and it's been postponed. So, just our listeners know. So many people wrote me about this and, and reached out to us. They wanted to know where and when and so on. Yes, so, I know people were yeah. looking forward to it on our side as well because yeah. you know we were partnering. Partnering, mm-hmm. but yes. it will happen. Just not today. Not today, and we'll let you know when. But here is Professor Shepherd, and we're talking. Uh, yes. <laughs> um, for important day today, of course, I know you want to talk a little bit about that, but we're looking ahead to tomorrow, African yes. Holocaust Day and Reparations Day. But yes. um, usually around this time, for, for the last few years, we're, we, we are usually together, you know that. Last time we were... <laughs> <laughs> yes, um, you know, every time I think about yeah. 2015 in mm-hmm. Morant Bay, mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. when the, reparation, the, the National the March, yeah. Commission on Reparation partnered with RFM, you know? Yeah. To do, and with birth sam- to hear Bert Samuel's fantastic play and right. to have a discussion around that. I mean, that was 
so fantastic. You know? oh, wasn't it though? And we got a chance to hear some of it yesterday also yes, um, on um, your program. You know, I thought, yes. you know, uh, you just said on your program that each year we have new people listening to our programs or mm -hmm. becoming aware of their history and so we or not <laughs> so yeah. we have to keep the education going each yeah. year sometimes i say but we did this already last year should i really do it again this year and, yeah. and, and the answer is yes you have to Yes, um, we have to repeat this for those who are coming in and repeating yes. it for those who have heard it before too, just to remind ourselves of, of, of what we already know. Exactly. Uh, so, so that, uh, and you, right, so, so we, we, we had that. And then in 2006, we, we also partnered on the In Search of Paul Bogle. That was the first one oh, we did. Oh, my goodness. In Search of Paul Bogle, where we did it. Yes. I am so sorry that COVID-19 will not allow us to restart the in search of series we yes. have to do that one of these days you know yes most definitely that's um, the way to really connect our communities you know mm -hmm, to our history mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and to share that with with the wider audience mm -hmm. it, it was really fantastic that initiative that you had was just that we had this world. yes and prof there's another thing um so uh, from 2006 you we've been having this conversation one of the things that came out of the in search of series and then later on when you um headed the 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 national jamaica national heritage trust as chair mm -hmm. chairperson um what came out one of the things that came out was uh memorializing um mm -hmm. those who fought with paul bogle yes. um in morant bay mm -hmm. uh, that hasn't happened why not yet not yet. Um, the conversations have been ebbing and flowing, but really, um, we really must do this. And, uh, you know, there's a new group out of St. Thomas. Mm -hmm. These are people in the diaspora who have formed themselves in, into a, a little group. I think they're having a meet, an online meeting today as well. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, they are trying to restart the project because they are saying that this this has to happen. It it can't be that there's no collective monument. You know, at the back of the courthouse there is a a, a mass grave, mm -hmm. but we don't know who are the people in it. Mm -hmm. But we have the names thanks to Dorit Abrams and Professor Clinton Hunt. Their mm -hmm. research. Yes. Um. We have the names of at least some of those who are in that mass grave. And I think we owe it to, to them to have a wall of remembrance. And, you know, you and I have been talking about this for ages. Yes. And uh, we have made representation. So far, it has happened. I've reached out again to the Jamaica National Heritage Trust. And so, um, so has this group. I don't think they are ready to come forward yet to talk about their activities. Mm -hmm. But I know mm -hmm. that I'm going to try to join their meeting today mm -hmm. um, just to see how far they have reached with their plans. So yes. I think we'll hear more about it as time goes on. But I think enough people are concerned that monuments um, continue to come down elsewhere mm -hmm. and new monuments to be thought of. But in our space, we don't seem to have that same energy. Yeah, and you that, wonder that concerns me. Yes, and you wonder why. And this is even more concerning than many, you know, because I, I know that you know funds were allocated. I've I've done the interview, so I know. I I remember, mm. um, you know, being told that all right, so this is going to be done by by 2015. In other words, we were yes. we should have seen that in 2015. Mm. Mm. Um, so, mm. so that 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 is concerning. But let's see where that goes then, and we keep we'll keep, yes, keep I, our I eyes think on I'm it. I'm just going to mm -hmm. try to support this new group. Yes, I have I have tried to. They reach out to me to give advice as to the people in Jamaica to contact about these kinds of things. And, mm -hmm, of course, mm -hmm. they have to contact the Jamaica National Heritage Trust. Yes. They have to contact the Ministry of Culture. Mm -hmm. um, so they are on to that. And let us see if this well, time... Yes, yes. Um, Mother the Great Stone will move. Oh man, I'm telling you, I saw what, where I can find that song. <laughs> it's really good. Uh, me too. <laughs> you know, so Prof, um, uh, there is a well. Let us start with. Uh, we, we have two things to talk about. One, the the date itself tomorrow, which is African yes. Holocaust Day, and then what the Center for Caribbean Research um, third anniversary. So let us start with the um, October 12th being. Yes. African yes. Holocaust Day and reparations and so and so much. Um, right. so situate so, that for us, please. You know, yeah. everybody has been asking when did this, when did October 12 become reparation? The other people are saying we never hear about that. 
it's not a UN international day. Of course it's not. Mm. <laughs> I can't imagine yeah. that that would ha ever happen. Wow. <laughs> but it seems that in the aftermath of the World Conference Against Racism in 2001 in Durban, you know, mm -hmm. um, advocates around the world began to hold discussions about finding a day to unite everyone around the issue of reparation. Yes. So a group emerged called, the, called Colonialism Reparation. And mm -hmm. in 2008, they seem to have launched International Day for Reparations mm -hmm. related to colonization on October 12th. And this was apparently approved and supported by the Assembly of Social Movements of the World Social Forum, which was held in, in Tunis in March 2013. So since then, people have, a lot of people have signed on to the, you know, advocates around the world have signed on to the, to the um, initiative. Mm -hmm. And they have an open... Um, link where people can join you know in solidarity yes. so but there are others who are saying and yeah and in the caribbean i know that there was an effort too to support october 12 each year mm -hmm. as reparation day because they said that that would unite the those who are supporting indigenous holocaust um indigenous genocide day mm -hmm. and african holocaust day they felt that october 12 is a day that really represents the, the 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 end of the kinds of civilization, yes. um, the kind of the kind of civilization that was in our region and in the Americas before what the rest of our I call Christopher Kumbokos, <laughs> um, Kumbok of the mm -hmm, indigenous mm -hmm, people. Mm -hmm. So this is gaining some kind of traction, yes. But it's not supported by everyone because people think we're taking away the the attention from what happened to the indigenous people who who were the first to en to encounter the the, uh, the assault mm -hmm. um by Iberians, you know the, because of that Iberian project yes so so i say to myself well you know we are calling for reparation for indigenous people because of what they went through we also know that it is in the aftermath of the columbus project that las casas and others supported the idea of um, trafficking enslaved people across. Mm -hmm. So 1492 mm -hmm. is not only about indigenous genocide, it's also about African ens the start of African enslavement. When Africans were in this part of the world as free people before, yes. you know, we have evidence of that. Ivan Van Sertim Malong told us that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, so, so this, this idea that we unite, our, we, we, we put everything under the umbrella of reparation day to me is okay you know mm -hmm. it's okay mm -hmm. because it gives us a chance to say why reparation day mm -hmm. why reparation day reparation day because of the atrocities against indigenous people started on october 12 1492 and atrocities against en enslaved africans who were trafficked mm -hmm. and whose descendants continue to suffer harm and mm -hmm. also all those you know who have been affected by colonialism in Africa, in Asia, Oceania, mm -hmm, colonizers mm -hmm. have disfigured the world wherever they have been. And I don't think there's any place in the world, there are few places mm -hmm. in the world which have not had this experience. So mm -hmm. it's a global phenomenon. And uh, on um, October 12, the Center for Operation Research will have an event to recognize mm -hmm. the day, and but, but to focus on indigenous genocide. Mm -hmm. All right, so let me take a quick break, um, Prof. Just hold a line for me and we'll come okay. back and, and pick up from there. That's right, CC Holy Bula, so nice. Mmm. All right, it's 17 minutes after 8 o'clock. You're inside of the Africa Forum. It is Running Africa, an important day today, but also looking ahead to tomorrow which is um, Reparations Day, African Holocaust Day, um, the Indigenous People Genocide Day. There's just, it, 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 you know, I, I, I kind of get why, you know, we have all of this happening right here, you know, Prof, um, mm -hmm. because of what it represents. Uh, and I do agree with you about the umbrella. There's, no, 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 there's not a problem. There shouldn't be a problem with having mm -hmm. an umbrella um, definition for the day. Yeah. All right. So, but, but there are people who would have preferred if it's... Um if it originated, if the idea originated elsewhere, and some mm -hmm. some people say, you know, it came from some group in Europe, but mm -hmm. to me, um, we can use the day how we want to use the day. 
But it's, you know? the, the date is important, isn't it? October 12, 1492. October 12 is important. And remember, we used to call it something else. Yes. We, don't, we won't say what we won't. it was called, but we, we, we burned that long time. <laughs> 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 no, the, you're the Cable Town and the tacky come out in you there. <laughs> she don't know where you come from. Where you come from? What can I tell you? <laughs> All right. So, so, so you, um, the UAE obviously will um, be marking the day, and yes. uh, tomorrow, talk to us about that. Yes. Mm -hmm. So, I think if people tune in to UAE TV tomorrow, mm -hmm. they're going to see a lot of programs. Um, you know, they will run a lot of back programs that mm -hmm. we have had yes. from the center and from, you know, other um, departments and individuals mm -hmm. who have over over the last three years, I would say, um, been focused on reparation. So the University of the West Indies, under the leadership of um, Sir Hilary Beckles, the current vice chancellor, has really insisted that since University of the West Indies started as a... Uh, uh, you know, well, it's a, a part of the University College London, but still, it, there was some money mm -hmm. to establish a medical school to clean up the the mess, the, the diseases and the and and the health mess they left here. Mm -hmm. So, in a sense, it was kind of reparation for recovery <laughs> of our civilization, mm -hmm. and he thinks that the university must continue along, must recover that initial project or, or mandate of cleaning up our, our system mm -hmm. uh, having been established uh, with money from, from Britain. Not enough, of yeah, course, because yeah. if, if it had been enough, the country would have been better off. Yeah. But to continue to lobby, therefore, for reparation, because it's an what they started in 1948 here was is unfinished business. Yeah. But nevertheless, the university can do what it, it, it can, do what it can to continue on that path of repertory justice, calling for repertory justice. Mm -hmm. So the Center for Reparation Research was established um, in 2017 to like focus more the attention on this mm -hmm. and to try to win converse to this, you know, around the university. And I think that some of that is happening. Mm -hmm. um, so tomorrow we will focus, it, it will be reparation, it is reparation day, we'll focus on reparation. We are the Center for Reparation Research after all. Yes. However, we have chosen <laughs> to focus the third anniversary of, of our establishment by calling attention specifically for reparation for the indigenous peoples who were so scarred by the Columbus Project. Yes. So that is, will, will happen. Um, UETV will broadcast it on uh, Flow 130 um, at 8 p.m. Jamaica time. But and that is 9 p.m. Eastern Caribbean time, right? Mm -hmm. Or EST. Mm -hmm. Yes. So for those who are watching in the United States and so on, uh, it will be 9 p.m. Mm -hmm. But before that, at 8 a.m. tomorrow, Jamaica time, you recall Cabo when the center had its launch in 2017. Samir Nkrumah was here. Right. And gave the keynote address. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. We're going to replay that. Right. On, you, on UE TV? Morning. On UE TV? On UE TV. Okay, so 8 o'clock tomorrow morning. Yes. Right. Yeah. And then the program is, is really great. Um, as I said, we are focusing on the indigenous people because mm -hmm. we are calling attention to reparation for the indigenous peoples tomorrow. Even as we are also saying in the aftermath of 1492, African people were affected. Mm -hmm. But we have had dedicated programs to that. Last year, mm -hmm. we, we, we dedicated the second anniversary event to calling for reparation because of the, fan, the, the wealth that was generated um, by our people. Mm -hmm. and to develop Britain. Yes. So we had a symposium last year in, um, in Antigua mm -hmm. on banking, the financial institutions and their liability um, to people of African descent. Yes. We also focused on Eric Williams' capitalism and slavery as a way of showing the evidence for economic um, r reparation. Mm -hmm. So this year we, we said we are going to you know, focus on the indigenous people. So the symposium is called The Indigenous Peoples and Col Colonizing Deformities, mm -hmm. Africa, the Americas, and the Caribbean after 1492. And uh, we have on the program the Vice Chancellor, who is Chair of the CARICOM Operation Commission. We have Ambassador June Suma, who is Secretary General of the um, ACS. We have the former Prime Minister Patterson, who is statesman in residence at the P.J. Patterson Center for Africa, Caribbean Advocacy. We have a Kalinago 
from Dominica, who is now an MP um, in the Dominica Labour Party, Honorable Kozia Frederick, mm -hmm. and he will speak from his own experience, you know, and from the experience of his people. And then we have tributes from quite a few people. And thank you, my sister, for giving a tribute. <laughs> my um, pleasure. <laughs> yes. yes, Ron Daniels from <laughs> the the Institute of the Black World in the mm -hmm. USA. Mm -hmm. And I'm and the chair of the National African American Reparation Commission. Mm -hmm. Our brother, Bert Samuels, or um, Lalita Davis Mattis from NCR. Mm -hmm. we, have, we have a tribute from the Working Group of Experts on People of African Descent. The chair is Dominique Day. Mm -hmm. and from Earl Bousquet um, from St. Lucia. So it's a combination of panel discussions but yes. also tributes because it's, after all, a celebration of where we have come three years on yes. as a center. But we really want to want people tomorrow to think about the Kalinago, the Mayas, the Aztec, the Garifuna, other indigenous peoples around the world who have First Nation peoples um, you know, in the Americas, mm -hmm. who really suffered from the onslaught of um, the Columbus Project and the Iberian Project, because it wasn't only Columbus. He, he, you know, he didn't have the resources to sail across the seas by himself. Yes. He was backed, mm -hmm. you see. Mm -hmm. So we have to call it sometimes the Iberian Project, as yeah. some people do. Yes. So, so while we are marking the, and the moral, it's, it's interesting that the moral the war started on October 11 today, right? It is 65, because the two are, they are connected. 1492 is not only 1492 and stop, you know? Mm -hmm. All the colonizing deformities stemmed from that initial journey to yeah, our part know. of the world. Yeah. And so, it is hope that we will find ways to reflect on this mm -hmm. and to consider my my disappointment, though, Kabu, yes. is that Jamaica seems untouched by global developments <laughs> in the area of indigenous rights. Mm. Uh, you know, I don't know if I'm wrong. No, you're not. I mean, statues are coming down all over the world. Yes. Because it does something to your psyche to see criminals hoisted on your landscape. I mean, who does that? Well, we know who, who did that. But do we still have to continue to do this? Well, and even while, and, and, but, but remember that we, we, we are putting up new ones, um, you know, th that roundabout they are uh, heading to between Junction and Anata Bay that's named after the European man. And you then, know, I've been and, trying to find out, to remember the name, and I just for the life is, of me, I can't remember the name. I wanted it, to talk about it on, on one of our programs. Somebody will write us soon and remind us the, the yes, name of that please, roundabout please, there. I want to remember, because yes. when I, the first time I saw it, you know, I called the MP, Mm -hmm. And I said, um, who is, why is this name, whatever its name? He gave and money. Who is this person? It's from the European Union. He gave them money. Yes, apparently. So uh, I'm yes. saying, so everybody who give you money to establish a road or to establish a, something or the other, no matter who they are, of who these people yes. are, you're going to just name? Yes, and, and any consideration for our history. But look at the Ian Fleming Airport. Yes. The Ian Fleming Airport. And I can tell you that there's a lot of activities happening there. I can hear every time a Learjet pass. Learjet's yes, passing yes. up and down. But we don't seem you to know? have a philosophy of development. Right. We don't seem to have a philosophy of independence. What we probably do? Uh, we don't have the right one, let's say. <laughs> That's the <a> thing. <laughs> we don't have the right one. <laughs> That's the thing. Because but, how is it that we are talking about black, we are parroting Black Lives Matter. I don't know if we believe in that, really. Not really. Uh, not not know, as a state. Yeah, not I as a state. I don't think they really believe that. But, but the action is different. Because why is Queen Victoria still standing in St. William Grant Park? And why is there no monument to St. William Grant in that park? Only the name. It tells I'm us. Call, I've been where calling for it to be renamed. Yeah. St. William Grant Park for, for, for workers. Or the St. Yes. William Grant Park... St. William Grand Workers Park. Yes. Because many of the people there already are, are leaders in the labor movement. Mm -hmm. And we need Aggie Bernard put up there. We need Queen Victoria taken down and Aggie Ber Bernard put up there in her place. The bottom we line is that we're going to have to take... We're, taken down and we need we're going to have to take them down, down ourselves, Puff. We have to take them down ourselves. This, it, it, it is what it is. It is where we are. It tells us what time of day we're at. And I've, I've heard you... 
on your program on Saturdays, literally, you know, j- j- hammering this in. Um, and, and no change. So, it, you know, sometimes we're just going to have to do what we're going to have to well, do. I am going to write yeah. again. Yeah. In other words, I'm going to try negotiation. I'm <laughs> going to... Okay. <laughs> 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 but I will write again. Because yes. I have written. Yeah. But so I'm going to write again. I also wrote that we must stop this um, Musgrave Medal, giving out this Musgrave Medal. Mm-hmm. Why can't we find somebody else to name that medal after? Is the fact that you... You establish a place, but you were a colonial person. A col- uh, you were there in the colonial period. You're a colonialist. Mm-hmm. Why do we have a medal called Governor Musgrave Medal? Uh, we, Prof, I'm sorry we have to leave it on that question, you know, and I know there's much more we have to talk about. Anyway, let you me know. just quickly remind yeah. people to, to, to watch you with TV tomorrow at um, 8 a.m. and also at 8 p.m. Right. for the third anniversary event of the Center for Reparation Research. And please, we are focusing on the indigenous people and what happened to them. And uh, I repeat, Columbus must fall. Columbus must fall. Thank you so much, Professor Vereen right. Shepherd. Thank okay, you so yeah, much. Thank you, All right. Good morning to you, my brother Lloyd, Dr. Lloyd Eubank Green. Earlier, I spoke about uh, Egypt and the uh, ancient Kemetians and some of our black brothers and sisters, African brothers and sisters, who are pushed from Cairo, pushed from the pyramids, pushed from the desert, all the way back into Aswan, up into the caves of Aswan and so on. And, and uh, you know, so, so Dr. Uh, Lloyd Van Green wrote to say, good morning, Sadat was the last black leader. Um, in Egypt and he said black skin but not so sure about inside and I said to him true 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 and uh, Dr. Lloyd Bank as I'm reading that you're sending me another note you said I actually saw his name or that is Michael Schumann you said I actually saw his name in Germany some years ago at a tube station he could have been the head of the European Union at the time yes I think that's what he was and so that anywhere they give money um, we look at black people just running back at them pee pee clock clock and name everything after them. Why did we name the airport at Boscabel, Ian Fleming Airport? Why, why did we name the, that airport Ian Fleming Airport? Answer that question. When you answer that question, you would have answered many questions. Why did Jamaica name the Boscobel Airport, the Ian Fleming Airport? By the way, as we're going through these moments of COVID-19 and so on, um, there there is still a problem in Jamaica regarding how we are dealing with the communication around COVID-19. We're not necessarily hearing from the authorities how to prevent COVID-19 through boosting your immune system. I'm not quite sure why. In England today, they're announcing in one of their newspapers that they they have developed a vaccine and it's ready for black and ethnic minorities and older people. That is blatant racism that nobody seems to be challenging. We have Bill and Melinda Gates saying that, you know, any vaccine that is developed should first be given to black people. (laughs) And we're somehow not paying that no mind. It doesn't mean anything much to us. Um, We have Donald Trump faking COVID-19 and coming out with (laughs) COVID-20. You know, none of it is funny. You know, we we, we are, as Miss Lou said, we Jamaican people, we we, we take in teeth, keep a heart bond. And that's what's happening here, you know. But they have a vaccine that's coming that they're going to try on black people before anybody else. In England, they put it on the front page of their newspaper. Check the newspapers in Birmingham. They've, it's, on the first, it's on the front page of the newspaper that the vaccine is ready for BAME. This is what they're calling black and ethnic minority people in, in England and older people. That's on the front page. This is dry eye racism. This is racism in your face. In Jamaica, they're not, you know, we know that if you use up your garlic, 
drink your herb tea like what your grandmother teach me. You know, use the, the single Bible, use the moringa leaf, use the, the rosemary leaf, you know, mix it with a little ginger. Boost your immune system, eat your yellow foods, cut out the white rice and the white flour, and so on and so forth. And eat properly and exercise. Get your sunlight. It is critical. It is important, especially for the children who are now studying at home, who go to class at 8 o'clock in the morning and who don't come off until after 3, you know, between the breaks. Make sure they're getting their sunlight. When they get up before they go on the computer, you know, walk them around the house, even if they don't want to go, hold them on and walk them around the house. Walk them outside, make them get little vitamin D. You know? And let's boost our immune systems. Let us do that. To, 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 to ensure that whatever this is and whatever cause it that is killing people and giving people all kinds of um, illnesses, that we are, the, our immune system can fight it. You know, it's something that we have to consider and think about here on the island in Jamaica and wherever you're listening from. You'd have realized by now that the soundtrack this morning is all from South Africa. Good morning to you, Mr. Ian Forrest. <laughs> the soundtrack is all from South Africa. So we're playing um, Hugh Masekela, and we're also playing not just Hugh Masekela. We're doing a, 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 a few. We're doing Mungin and Gema uh, and the team. Some of that also from South Africa this morning. Now I'm going to go to my brother in Trinidad. You know, it's interesting that we do uh, a Caribbean link every week because we think that this is what we need to do. This is where we need to go in the, um, the, the new reset uh, is to link with ourselves and link with each other to ensure that we are maintaining this, um, the, the need to, to do, maintaining the, the network to, for development. So we, we, we link with the Caribbean and we link with the continent of Africa. So we were scheduled to link with Haiti this morning with Professor Baina Bello. Um, we're not getting her on the phone lines. We're still trying. But in the meantime, we're going to go to Trinidad because they say whoever eat the cascadura must return to Trinidad. <laughs> so <laughs> I know I'd make, I'd make you laugh, um, my brother David Mohammed. <laughs> <laughs> Samuel Selvon. When, when you read Samuel Selvon in high school, you tend to remember every little thing, you know. Mm-hmm. And so I remember that from Ways of Sunlight. Whoever eats the cascadura must return to Trinidad. So here we are. I have never eaten the cascadura, and I've been asking you about it, David, and you, never, you come to Jamaica all the time, you never carry one. And that's a shame. <laughs> <laughs> About that. You, next that time, really next good. time, next time. <laughs> All right, so welcome to the space. I know that we are coming up to the anniversary of the Million Man March and that there are, yes. are plans in place to, to commemorate that. Let's talk about that. Tell us what, what uh, remind our listeners, the younger ones, of what happened and um, in terms of the Million Man March and then what are the plans? Well, thank you so much, Sister Kabu. I have to salute you once again for the magnificent work that you continue to do. Thank you. And we admire you from this end of the Caribbean region. And it was come Friday, exactly mm-hmm. 25 years ago, mm-hmm. on Monday, October the 16th, 1995, where the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan called for a million man march in Washington, D.C., and two million black men showed up. Mm-hmm. There was, of course, a day up to this march, which was about a year and a half in the making, where a series of men-only meetings were held mm-hmm. all across the United States, led by Minister Farrakhan, where he was encouraging men to become better fathers, better husbands, and better brothers Mm-hmm. And really for us to organize ourselves in such a way as black men to be each other's keeper. Mm-hmm. We were encouraged to be mentors to the youth, mm-hmm. to visit our brothers in the prison, to connect with those who may have gone astray in a criminal lifestyle, to link with those brothers in the gangs, 
to not be judgmental towards each other, but to recognize that we are flesh of each other's flesh, mm-hmm. blood of each other's blood, and bone of each other's bone, but we've been disconnected by an enemy who withdrew us from Africa and made us believe that we're different to one another, and destroying the family kinship ties and understanding between us. Mm-hmm. And so that brings up over a year and a half, three days, and then only the case culminated on October the 16th, where two million brothers showed up and were able to really have the greatest single event mm-hmm. in the history of the black struggle mm-hmm. in the 20th century. Mm-hmm. I, and so that... Uh the anniversary of obviously coming up before we go to what's what's planned for friday uh looking 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 back um were the were the objectives achieved and um how do you now and and the minister see um the state of the black race specifically as it relates to our black males men right well the objectives of the millennium march are really in motion because every year that there's a commemoration or anniversary of the Million Man March, there is another focus. So the main focus among us in 1995 was to atone and to engage in reconciliation and responsibility between us. We have so many unmended, broken ties that have never really been fixed. Mm-hmm. and we have become enemies of each other. Institutionally, sometimes young brothers grow from the childhood into the adolescent years and inherit gang conflict that their predecessors would have had without even knowing how that conflict would have started. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. All over the Western Hemisphere, almost everywhere, wherever youth exist, we have found ourselves under this dynamic of being on either side of a community borderline that has really shed a lot of blood between us. And so the first focus was on the man, the black man. Mm-hmm. And we were given the eight steps of atonement, which is really the art of peacemaking between our brothers, which is to point out the wrong, acknowledge and admit the wrong, confess the wrong that we did, repent and ask for forgiveness for our brother, then to atone then to forgive or grant the pardon, then to reconcile, and then to come into a perfect union with God. But five years after the Million Man March, the commemoration was centered around the family. Yes. And we had the Million Family March in 2000, where the minister um, renewed the marriage vows for mm-hmm. over 100,000 couples. Mm-hmm. And then five years after that, for the 10th anniversary of the Million Man March, we had the Millions More Movement. Yes. But uh, once again, we have the nine sub-organizations or nine ministries, health and human services, agriculture, education, defense, arts and culture, trade and commerce, justice, information and science and technology, as well as the eight task forces, family life, emergency management, religion, financial management, youth, housing, research and foreign affairs. Mm-hmm. And then we started forming all of these organizations and action groups and sub-committees around each of these things. Mm-hmm. This is how we built the yeah. Kwame Ture Education Center in Trinidad. Mm-hmm. By mm-hmm. forming committees, by organizing ourselves, by pooling our resources, yes. by understanding that alone, none of us could achieve any of this. Mm-hmm. But together, all of us collectively can achieve absolutely anything with no limitations or boundaries. Mm-hmm. And then, of course, coming up to the 19th anniversary, of the Million Man March. We were blessed to host it in Kingston, Jamaica. Mm-hmm. And the key objective there, of course, was to reconnect our people across the hemisphere with our brothers and sisters, whether it be on the continent or in Europe, mm-hmm. all of mm-hmm. us across the Caribbean. I mean, we have Chinese people thousands of miles away who are still closer to each other than African people who are just less than a hundred miles apart yes. in this region called the Caribbean. Yes, yeah. So to connect with Black mm-hmm. America and for us as Caribbean people to connect with one another mm-hmm. was another key objective. 
and the work continues and yeah. the mission goes on. Yeah. All right. And so this Friday, uh, what will be happening? Right. So this Friday, which will be October the 16th, once again, exactly 25 years after the fact, we commemorate the 25th anniversary of the Million Man March mm -hmm. virtually online and we will have some of the different Nation of Islam representatives, of course myself based in Trinidad mm -hmm. but representing the entire Eastern Caribbean, our beloved brother Brother Clive Muhammad who is a warrior on the front line for mm -hmm. justice and truth, mm -hmm. Brother Clive Muhammad representing Jamaica we have our brother Abdul Rahman representing Barbados, Brother Dennis Muhammad representing Guyana mm -hmm. Brother Khaled Shabazz representing Antigua and Brother Mikhail Muhammad representing St. Vincent as mm -hmm. well as a host of other guests mm -hmm. that we will have joining us mm -hmm. and you know, we, we look forward so much to sharing. We're going to be online yes. from 6 p.m. on Friday. And for information, we can go to the website, www.blackagendaproject.com, or you can email blackagendaproject at gmail.com, and we will be circulating the Zoom link or whatever because we intend to host it on a number of platforms mm -hmm. on the Facebook page of the Black Agenda Project as well as other Facebook pages um, a YouTube channel as well as the Zoom link so we're going to be circulating that rapidly throughout this week right. and of course blackagendaproject.com would mm -hmm. be the source center point to get that information and of course the email address blackagendaproject at gmail.com. All right. All right. Uh, sounds really good. Um, we hope to be there, um, Brother David, um, but I'll, I'll, I'll talk to you later, but we hope to be there um, for that. Yes. And, um, you know, interestingly enough, as you talked, I remember that 25 years ago, we, when the black, yeah. um, when, when, the, when the march was happening, um, I, I, as program director at IRFM, I remember how we were in and out of the studio. We were linking with, um, uh, people who were on the ground, or, or sister, sister, um, Farika, uh, was was was, you know, uh, linking back with us from from the ground of the march. I remember Ibo Cooper from here in Jamaica, and some of the other brothers had gone to the march, uh, and I remember carrying so much of, of of that. We carried so much of that on air here at Area FM, straight from the march, uh, you know, twenty five years ago. And then, at, at the, I remember also the. I was there in Washington, D.C. for, I think it was the 10th, and it, it was the Millions More March. Um, we covered yeah, that and carried movement, movement, yeah, movement and carried that, that live. Movement. Yes, we carried that live back to, to, um, to Jamaica. I was actually there in Washington, D.C. And then um, just recently, uh, it was the 19th, we were broadcasting live from the National Arena. Yeah. Yes. Uh, so, yeah. we, so we have been with you on the journey um, as, as uh, you know, to, for the, the different elements of this. Uh, so we hope to be there on Friday also. But thank you so much, my brother, yeah. and um, give our, our, our greetings to, to the minister and to the brethren. Thank you so much. Yes, thank you so much, Mr. Tabu. Once right. again, we salute you. Thank All you. All right, and thank you, my brother. <laughs> All right, Brother David Mohammed there, live from... Trinidad. We really did hope to go to Haiti. We still haven't been able to um, get your Professor uh, Nana Baino Bello. Um, we know it has to be something really serious in terms of her not being able to pick up on, on the phone lines. Uh, but we will check back in with her and um, she'll be with us another time. On the other side of this at nine o'clock, we're going live to Zambia. We're looking forward to making that African connection in the Zambia. Can't wait. Can't wait. Let me see. Let's go to uh, do this. Yeah. So we're looking ahead to tomorrow, uh, October 12, 1492, the Genoese, uh, Genoese uh, colonizer, Christopher Columbus, ventured into this part of the known world, starting the unbridled discrimination of indigenous people, Zambia. Oh, where well, my sister Denise Clark is uh, standing by. Uh, good morning, Denise. Well, good afternoon. Good morning. 
Okay, good morning, Kabul. How are you? <laughs> well, well, if you if you tour well, my sister. Everything all right on this side. I can't complain. It's a wow. nice Sunday afternoon. Wow. And what's the weather like? Sunny, rainy, breezy? It's sunny. It's okay. No, man, it's sunny. The okay. past couple of days have been really hot, and mm -hmm. we're just getting to the end of the dry season, so mm -hmm. approaching the rainy season. So we have, we've had some scattered showers, but yeah. it's a nice, beautiful Sunday afternoon today, so I can't complain. And you sound as if you're next door. Can I tell you, clear and as if, you know, you're almost as if you're in the studio. Really clear. Oh, cool. That's yes. good. Thank you so much. So, Denise, um, you are a, a world traveler. Let's just get that off the bat. <laughs> and have finally settled in uh, to, I'd say, Africa, continental Africa. So I want to start with your journeys, um, starting for, from Jamaica. And we, we said to our listeners earlier that, you know, you were with a hard NTA, uh, and we talked about that, uh, but then went to the Netherlands. Tell me a little bit about yeah. um, what happened in the Netherlands. What pushed you to move to the continent of, of Africa? And how long were you in the Netherlands? Okay. Um, so, I, yeah, I was working with Heart Trust in Jamaica at the time. In mm -hmm. fact, I worked with Heart Trust for about 10 years. Mm -hmm. I was um, an instructional designer there. And basically my job would be to work with the private sector. You know, Hart does a lot of work with the private sector. Mm -hmm. I was responsible for developing curricula for a couple of the sectors, mm -hmm. like hospitality and tourism. Um, there was some in construction as well. Um, and we started this project with a group out of the Netherlands that was actually funded by the Dutch Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Mm -hmm. It's called IICD. And at that point, IICD was working with a couple of entities, including Heart in Jamaica. Mm -hmm. And we were looking at how information and communication technologies could actually be better supported and integrated into kind of everyday work. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, we worked, I was working, so I was duly working with Heart and on the project. And mm -hmm. Out of the blue one day, they said, okay, but we have a position available. We would actually like you to join our team. Mm -hmm. And um, believe it or not, I had one night to make up my mind. <laughs> yes. And it was it was a bit of a dilemma. Mm. Um, I think if I listened to my mother, I would still be in Jamaica. Because, <laughs> of course, she was born. How, how would I move with a six-year-old yes. to a country where I didn't know the language? Mm-hmm didn't know anybody and um of course leaving your family behind and and yes. i said it was basically a night of making the decision and mm -hmm. i decided to go because mm -hmm. i kept saying to myself if i don't mm -hmm. then i'm going to spend the rest of my life wondering what if yes. what if i'd done yeah what would have happened mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. so I made sure that I had enough get Vex money. In other words, <laughs> there, if I yes. needed to come back home. Yeah. And um, I moved with my daughter. I went a couple of months ahead of her, mm -hmm. but moved with my daughter um, in, I think, 2001. Mm -hmm. And um, worked with that Dutch organization for about six years. We were looking at information and communication technologies in education. Mm hmm and I had the responsibility for working on Jamaica and Ghana at the time. Yeah. And so I think my first visit to Ghana was also in about 2001. And of course, I loved it. I fell in love with it. Ghana reminded imagine. me so much of Jamaica. Don't you? Yes. And I remember, yeah. I remember just standing at the tram stop in Holland one day and it was winter. And mm. I said to myself, boy, I don't know why I'm doing this. Mm. <laughs> Because it was just so cold. Yes. <laughs> but more importantly, I think my daughter was getting to the end of primary school. Mm -hmm. I had opted to send her to a primary school, a Dutch primary school, so she could learn the language and everything. Mm -hmm. But I think as she got older, I wanted to either move back home or move to a country where she could see people like her. Yes. I mean, of mm -hmm. course, there are quite a few blacks in the Netherlands, but we were always in the minority. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to give her that um, foundation that I myself had in Jamaica yes. in terms of seeing people that look like her mm -hmm. and that she could relate to. And so that's how I moved to Ghana. Mm -hmm. I applied for a job there and moved in 
2006. Okay. Uh, so left behind the Dutch and went to work for the Irish. They had a project. <laughs> But the, 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 sorry, the, the, the way you said that, you know, Diane, it's just so easy. I applied for a job there and, and then, you know, um, so it, it's a, it was that easy. You applied and you got the job. <laughs> well, uh, you yeah. know, I think, I mean, like everywhere else, you mm -hmm. have to work hard. You have to apply yourself. I think mm -hmm. when you do an interview for a position, you are, of course, going to show um, what you're bringing to the table. Mm -hmm. And I always tell my family and friends that a lot of what I learned in heart mm -hmm. was the foundation for what laid the way for many of the opportunities. Yes. I think coming from heart, which was a statutory organization, going to work embedded in a ministry in Ghana mm -hmm. was actually a good match. Mm -hmm. So both in terms of looking at the educational component and even towards the end of my contract in Ghana, started to work on technical and vocational education. Mm -hmm. So again, a lot of the foundation from heart came across to help with that. Yes. Um, so, no, jobs were not handed to me on a silver mm. platter. <laughs> I wish they were. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but um, definitely yeah. in terms of the skills, in terms mm -hmm. of the education, in terms of the experience. Mm -hmm. And I did, all of my, I did all of my education in Jamaica. I went mm -hmm. to Immaculate, went to UAE. Mm -hmm. um, did my master's at UAE. Um, did do a master's by distance with Nova Southeastern University, but that's my basic education background. Yeah, yeah. But up to that time, before I moved, my work experience was hard. Yeah, and so, and um, so you, you had already gone to Ghana, so and, and as you said, you fell in love with Ghana. Uh, so it was it was easy to to make that transition in your mind you, in terms of making a decision between leaving um, living in the, the, the Netherlands and going to Ghana as opposed yes. to coming back to, to to Jamaica. So you chose Ghana. Yes, I chose Ghana. And I mean, for me, Jamaica is always home. There's mm -hmm. no two questions about that. Mm -hmm. I just was not ready to come home yet. Yes. Um, I thought there was more to see. Mm -hmm. I liked the idea of being able to work on the continent. I liked the fact that this opportunity was for Ghana. Mm -hmm. And so, again, it was one of those, if I don't try this, <laughs> I would probably regret it for the rest of my life. Yeah, and yeah. so I decided, yeah, I wanted mm -hmm. to give it a go. Mm -hmm. I, had, I had already made good friends um, between the work I was doing in Ghana. And so I mm -hmm. think that's settling in. Yeah. was not very traumatic. It was quite smooth. Where, where, um, where did you live Ghana in Ghana? Very... I lived about an hour outside of the capital, Accra. I mm -hmm. lived in Teshinungwa. Mm -hmm. And so um wanted somewhere, of course, that was safe. Mm -hmm. Wanted somewhere where I had the yard space that could remind me of my home in Jamaica. Mm -hmm. And um, wanted somewhere that offered me the flexibility in terms of work and school for yeah. my daughter at the yeah. time. And so your daughter was moving. To, how old was she now? She was 12. Right. And so she was and moving. I still, remember when, mm -hmm. I still remember when we moved. <laughs> we had a hard time getting her into a Ghanaian school because her English by then was not very good. Because, uh, of course, between 6 and 12, yes. she had on the Dutch primary school. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, that was the first time in a very long time I was able to help with homework and everything. But mm -hmm. I think it was a little bit of a it was a little bit of a rough transition for her. Yeah. But she's a good kid, and I think yeah. she did. She yeah, she mm -hmm. ended up really liking it, settling, mm -hmm. and um, lived with me there for for um, three almost four years. Mm -hmm. At that point, we decided that she had to. Um, we needed to find the security of her finishing high school. Yes. I think when they're younger and you need to move, it's a little bit easier. Mm -hmm. But once they start high school, once mm -hmm. you're looking at the farm mm -hmm. and afterwards, and at that point I decided to send her back to Jamaica. Okay. So she came back when she was about 15 mm -hmm. and then did finished up high school and finished up university in Jamaica mm -hmm. and actually is still in Jamaica. I hope she's listening to me now. <laughs> <laughs> Good morning, daughter. <laughs> All right. So, um, uh, wow, what a journey. And, and, and for her, what an experience also. Um, Netherlands, Ghana, 
um, finishing up school in Jamaica. So, so what was it like for you, though, um, living and working in Ghana? Um, so, so much like Jamaica, and I suppose yet so much different uh, in, in many ways. Were there any challenges? Yeah. In, yeah uh-huh. I think my first challenge was... Um, the field that I worked in at the time was, um, especially in terms of development, was mm-hmm. very male-dominated and white-dominated. Mm-hmm. And I still remember the first day when I arrived at the ministry. Um, I was supposed to be introduced to the then chief director um, by my counterpart. Mm-hmm. And I was sitting in his waiting room. And uh, he kind of walked past me a couple of times. Of course, said good morning to everybody, you know. Mm-hmm. And then after he went into his office, my counterpart came and said, okay, Denise, you know, I'd like to now formally introduce you. And the chief director is like the permanent secretary mm-hmm. um, in a ministry back in Jamaica. Mm-hmm. And when I walked into his office, he did a double take. <laughs> and he said, to join Denise Clark. Mm-hmm. I said, yeah, the last time I checked, I was Denise Clark. <laughs> he said, but you're a woman. Oh. And I said, yes, the last time I checked, I mm-hmm. was a woman. And he said, but you're black. Oh. And I said, yes, true to that too. And this is happening but in Ghana. He wasn't being rude. I can understand. But he was not being rude. Mm-hmm. But Kabo, he wasn't being rude. Yes. When you look at a lot of the development work, and it's changed over the years since mm-hmm. I started, mm-hmm. but back then, the typical, the typical expats that would descend to work in a ministry would be white, and mm-hmm. it would, and they would be male. Mm-hmm. And so I think it was a, I think for him a pleasant surprise. Wow. And that's not the only place that I've seen that response. I've also worked in other countries where they expect to, they, you're not who they expect to see. And mm-hmm. I think with with um, Denise, which is commonly mispronounced as Dennis on this side, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and with a surname like Clark, yes. then yes, you're not you're not quite expecting a Jamaican woman with dreadlocks. So, but the response right. the response I must say has been positive. Mm-hmm. It's not as negative as it may sound, mm-hmm. but I think for him it was just a pleasant surprise. Mm-hmm. And Denise, you lived, you, I mean, working um, in, a, in a male-dominated field and, and, and out there uh, as, as, a, as a woman, um, you've lived uh, in, 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 not just in Ghana, but you've also lived in Liberia and now you're in Zambia. Now, before you go to Zambia, yeah. before you go to Liberia, though, I want to talk, and you lived in Ghana for, for how many years? I lived in Ghana for about six years. For six years. Wow. Wow. Yeah. Yes, so so you're Ghanaian, right? <laughs> so. I like to think I'm Ghanaian. I remember my mom visited eh? yes. My mom visited me yes. in Ghana, yes. and she kept saying to me, Denise, it doesn't feel like I'm anywhere new. It feels like I mm. am. Mm-hmm. I'm I'm someplace familiar. Mm-hmm. It feels like Jamaica, but Jamaica of a different time. Yes. I think for her, it mm-hmm. was it was interesting to see. I mean. She was blown away when she saw that we were make that in Ghana, for example, the make dukuno or mm-hmm. blue draws. Right. It was nice for her to see that the same types of food that mm-hmm. we would get in Jamaica, we mm-hmm. easily got in Ghana. You could mm-hmm. get your coca yam, and I remember her even telling me that as a child growing up, you know, she mm-hmm. used to also have coca yam leaf, you mm-hmm. know. Yes. And so, yes. for me, for me, Ghana was both interesting from a work perspective Mm -hmm. but also very interesting from a personal perspective because there were just so many similarities Mm -hmm. that you could see and understand and feel and Mm -hmm. sometimes it's not even sometimes I myself would have that feeling that oh you know this just feels like somewhere I've been before Mm -hmm. and I think Mm -hmm. I think when you think about all of the history that you read in terms of the slave trade and everything, I mm-hmm. think to be in Ghana and to understand it from the other perspective mm-hmm. is also quite, it's quite humbling mm-hmm. um, and quite informative. Mm-hmm. So I liked Ghana for that. Ghana was one of the first places outside of Jamaica mm-hmm. where I felt absolutely at home yeah. um, without even trying too hard. Wow. And, and it's important for us to say that, you know, because... 
uh, so many persons in their minds are trying to make the, de the decision as to whether or not to go to Ghana in particular. And I know, for example, when we were there last year, that so many persons had that conversation. Um, we heard so many persons yeah. saying, I would live here. I know I can live here. I can live here. But then have so many other questions. And to hear somebody like you who, have been, who spent six years in Ghana working and living, um, not as a tourist, and I think it's important for us to come out of the frame of mind of the tourist when we're going to Africa to be able to, to absorb and to understand um, wherever we are in, yeah. Af in, in Africa. Um, there, there's something that happened... Yeah happened um, that, that, that connects us on a different level, Denise, um, you, both of us, um, that I'm working on a documentary now, and you have written, about, you have written a blog about this documentary that I'm, well, you've written a blog about this place that I'm working on, um, the documentary on, and it's so interesting because yeah. I didn't know you had that blog, you didn't know I'd gone, and... Um, and, and no, I didn't. Yeah. yeah. And so we're, we're trying to get, I'm trying to get you onto my documentary right now um, about, about, a, <laughs> about a place in Ghana. And we can talk about it briefly. Um, uh, go, go mm -hmm. tell, all right, so let's start. Go ahead. You, you tell us about this place that you've visited. I'm doing the documentary, so that will come out later on. No worries. Yes. So... Um, we used to do, uh, yeah, used to work with education, and mm -hmm. I remember one day going up into the Ebre Hills, which is overlooking Accra, mm -hmm. and they had the Presbyterian um, teacher training college there. Mm -hmm. And uh, I've always, I mean, Presbyterian teacher training college is a, is a big college in Ghana, it's well known. Mm -hmm. And even as you drive up into the hills, you see a lot of Presbyterian schools dotted all over. So they're mm -hmm. very big in terms of religion and education. Mm -hmm. And when I went to the Presbyterian teacher's college, I was talking with... I had gone, I, I like looking at different places and I had gone into the church because they had the most beautiful stained glass windows mm -hmm. and I was asking the gentleman who was at the church about it and he wanted to know where I was from, that mm -hmm. I'm from Jamaica. He said, really? But we have some Jamaicans buried in the graveyard. Mm -hmm. I said, what do you mean you have Jamaican stories <laughs> in the graveyard? Yeah. Yes. And then carry me around. Mm -hmm. Some of the tombstones were quite weathered. Mm -hmm. But I didn't know that Jamaicans played a huge role in establishing the Presbyterian Teacher Training College in Ghana. Yes. yes. And so a couple of weeks afterwards, I went to the library mm -hmm. and because I wanted to understand more. And it was fascinating because in the mid-1800s, you had a group of 12 families. Mm -hmm. um, one person, if memory serves me right, was from Barbados, yeah. and the rest Bermuda. were from Jamaica. Yes. Yes. But the, the king of the Aquipim region had said to the Swiss Basel missionary, the only way I will believe in this God of yours Mm -hmm. is if you show me people that look like me mm -hmm. that believe in him as well. Mm -hmm. And so, for some reason, the Swiss Basel missionary actually went and recruited missionaries from Jamaica, from yeah. the Presbyterian Church. Mm -hmm. And in fact, the families were all connected to a church in Flankers. Mm -hmm. That's what the records show. Yes, You had the family of Miller which I also was quite excited about because my mother's maiden name is Miller. Mm -hmm. You had the family of Clarks. Mm -hmm. My last name is Clarks. There you Clark. go again. Yes. You had um, Mullings. Mm -hmm. Quite a few, and it yes. was all well documented. Mm -hmm. And they were the first group of Jamaicans, really, that mm -hmm. came over as missionaries. And they're good examples of the same thing happening, I think, in Nigeria, in Sierra Leone as well, I've heard, although I haven't done any extensive research on those pieces. Mm -hmm. But they basically came and set up this whole um, section up mm -hmm. in the hills, which yeah. is still called Jamaica. Mm -hmm. They built the first well there. They carried ackee trees there. They carried coca yam, mm -hmm. which is a staple in, in Ghana. So it was interesting to just see how that had happened. And yeah. my, my biggest regret 
is not making enough time when I come to Jamaica to go down to that church in Slankers. Well, because I also want to see what the documentation and that well, consider, is. considering that you're working with me on the documentary now, <laughs> yes, <ma'am>. we, we'll, <laughs> go, <laughs> we'll go there together. Hopefully, you can come. We go there together. But um, but but it's interesting yeah. because when you when you sent me this blog and I you know I sent you the picture of of me standing by by the by the church actually by the plaque because we went there last year with the group Sister P and the others and, and and we broadcast live from there last year also from the from the community um, met some of the yeah. um, the descendants of the Jamaicans and they recognize who they are recognize themselves know their history know that they're from Jamaica and so on and so that was an yeah. interesting situation um, so so you know just to, just just as an aside to point out that that you had gone and and, and uh, met into that also met upon that now um, Denise you didn't stay in Ghana for more than six years. You left Ghana and you went to Liberia. Right? So tell us, why did yes. you leave Ghana and, and, a little, and, and a little bit about Liberia now? Yes. <laughs> Liberia, well, Liberia was actually the first place that I didn't move for work. Um, yes. I actually met my husband in Ghana. Mm-hmm. Um, he is Liberian and he decided to move back home mm-hmm. and I decided to move home move back to Liberia with him. Mm -hmm. Of course, being in love, you think that, yes, it's going to be similar to Accra because, of course, Accra and Ghana was my gold standard. Right, (laughs) yes. But I moved to Liberia. Mm -hmm. And Liberia was also interesting, still Mm -hmm. in West Africa, but a totally different experience. Mm -hmm. Um, At that point, Liberia had just, I think it was probably about 10 14 years outside of the civil war Mm -hmm. and so a lot of the infrastructure was still rudimentary Mm -hmm. i remember which is of course very different from from accra Mm -hmm. i remember having to dig a well because Mm -hmm. the the piped water system didn't work Mm -hmm. we would live on generators because the the electricity company was not back up and running yet. Mm-hmm. And it's been interesting to see how slowly over time things have improved. Yes. But I think there's still a lot left to be done. Mm-hmm. Um, and so it was trying to make sure it did. I think that was one of the one of the more um, difficult transitions for me. Mm-hmm. Luckily, I have a uh, fabulous mother-in-law and a supportive husband yes but just the basic pieces of everyday life and mm-hmm. what you would take for granted mm-hmm. that was that was really rough how long was rough yeah how long did you stay in liberia liberia was it going on nine years all right so even though even though the transition was rough you were there for almost a decade wow um so over so yeah, you'd have, I mean, so you'd have seen things say, change Yes, and at the mm-hmm. end of the day, your, I mean, your husband is your husband, then. Eh? Mm-hmm. I yes. mean, yeah, so if you're going to make a good go at it, then you're mm-hmm. going to make a good go of it. Um, yeah. I still have my get vex money. <laughs> that is always in the pocket. Yes, <laughs> But yes. of course. Yeah. And I think, I think it also made me tougher in other ways as well. Mm-hmm. I think, um, I think I learned not to take a lot of things for granted, yeah. you know? Um, I think the journey up to then had been very, very smooth. Mm-hmm. Um, you always had the conveniences where, whenever and wherever you needed them. Mm-hmm. But I think Liberia created a different type of resilience. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. And I admire the Liberian people a lot for that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, when you, when you think about the history, when you understand what they've gone through, mm-hmm. and it's the first post-conflict country that I've lived in, Mm-hmm. But also the first post-conflict country where they will talk about the conflict, which I think is also quite um, quite good. I've been to other post-conflict countries before mm-hmm. where you're not even allowed to mention that there was conflict, you know? Right. Well, and the Liberian people are tough and hardy and resilient. Yeah. And that's one of the things that I mm-hmm. really admire mm-hmm. about them. And as they talk about post-conflict, you know, interestingly enough, when we went into Ghana in 92 for the first time, um, we were to- mm-hmm. in some places we couldn't talk much about um, what had happened in terms of the coup and so on, and right. that was 1992. So I understand that, and I had a similar feeling in Togo 
that you know there was this you, you almost felt as if you were under surveillance in Togo Togo for me you, you know is, a, is an interesting place we'll talk about that another time so I can understand um what, what what you're referencing just now with with Liberia post conflict, and it would have been um, more recent um, even in in Liberia, yeah. uh, and so Liberia would have differed yeah. a lot from 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 Ghana, wouldn't it? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it did. Even mm -hmm. even Liberia and English, I still hard for me to wrap my head around. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, no, yeah. I think, yeah, as I said, infrastructure was one thing. Um, yeah. Liberia was also the first country where I lived that legally operated dual currency. Mm -hmm. So you could go into the supermarket and pay for an item in U.S. dollars or the Liberian mm -hmm. dollar. Mm -hmm. um, it's a very... It also has its own tensions outside of the Civil War, I should say, related to that because mm -hmm. there's still quite a bit of uh, ethnic tensions that play up from time to time. Mm -hmm. um, but Liberia was also the country where I met the largest group of Jamaicans mm -hmm. that um, that we really became like family. That's Jamaicans so living, Ghana, yes, living, that's Jamaicans, Jamaicans. Okay, living in Liberia, that's Jamaicans living there. Yeah, man, living uh -huh. and working in yeah. Liberia. Yeah. There are two missionaries up mm -hmm. in Bangor, which is about a three and a half hour drive outside of the capital mm -hmm. of um, Monrovia. Mm -hmm. There's another guy there that's doing road construction. There were a couple of people who were with the UN military, Jamaicans who were with the UN military that mm -hmm. were there. Mm -hmm. um, another Jamaican who has gotten married and is living there. Mm -hmm. um, Jamaicans teaching at the American school. Mm -hmm. And so this was my family away from home. Yeah. We would meet for birthdays. Mm -hmm. We would meet for Christmas. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Yeah, and I'm sure I'm sure some of your listeners will know as well that the first lady for Liberia is also Jamaican. Right. Um, yes. So yeah, we had a little bit of a. I remember I remember when George, when President, were one, mm -hmm. and I had all of these phone calls. But you know, his wife is Jamaican, eh? Uh. Yeah, man, his wife is Jamaican. You know, you have to meet her. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and the, and, and what that means for us... Yeah, we heard that here too. And what that meant for us was, uh, okay, the, what, we, Jamaica is now in charge of Liberia. That's basically how we translated that. Because you know how we roll. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let me take a quick yeah. break, Daddy. I'll so come back now and talk about um, Zambia, how you got there and life in Zambia right after this. Make a toast to your future, the JTA Cooperative Credit Union and is by your side. All educators, the best is what you deserve. We'll keep your dreams alive. Competitive loans to help you grow. We'll take you higher. Great returns on your savings. Yeah. A bright future is in the making. Build the best you with the best credit union. We are committed to serving you. The JTA Cooperative Credit Union, serving our members, impacting lives positively. Hey, shop in comfort and style at DIB Home Center. Come enjoy our new design store for the best prices and power tools, such as Stanley, DeWalt, and Milwaukee. Bathroom fixtures like Moen and Delta, American Standard Toilet, tiles, doors, and windows, Rubbermaid storage containers and trash cans, lifetime folding tables and chairs, Samsung and LG TVs. So don't miss out. Visit DIB Home Center at 11 West Palm Avenue, Port Antonio. Call us today, 607 2472. DIB the home center we do it best all right we're back with you inside of the africa forum it is running african as we reunite the african family for development wherever we are on the continent of africa we do well and denise clark has been going through our sister has been going through africa she went to ghana she's moved on to liberia and now she's actually talking to us from zambia uh, Denise, thanks for, for staying with us. Um, what a fascinating story your life has been uh, in terms of uh, making Thank that you. connection with the African continent. So many of us have wanted to do that. So we are living through you vicariously. I can just tell you that off the bat. <laughs> All right. So you ultimately, you. after eight years in, Zam, in, 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 in Liberia, almost nine years, you went um, to, to Zambia where you are now. How did you make that move, and why did you make that move to Zambia? 
Um, I always like to challenge myself, and I think um, having, again, worked in the education system in Zambia for such a long time, I wanted a new challenge. Um, I had been working for a major funder in Liberia, um, had been the head of two projects, one in basic education and then another one in alternative education so for children out of school. Mm-hmm. And I felt like if I stayed, I would become a bit stagnant. And so still continue to work with the same organization that had hired me in Liberia, mm-hmm. but then came to Zambia to head up, a new, well, it's not so new anymore, um, education project, also a basic education project. We're working in five of the ten provinces in Zambia mm-hmm. and reaching about 1.4 million um, learners. Mm-hmm. And this is a reading project. It's basically trying to ensure that by the time Zambian students um, leave grade three, mm-hmm. they have a good foundation to continue um, primary education. Mm-hmm. The work we do now is focused on mother tongue instruction, so basically being able to do the teacher training, the development of teaching and learning materials, Mm -hmm. the support for learners in seven of the local languages here. There are 72 local languages in Zambia, Mm -hmm. but this particular project is working in seven of those. All right. And we're working about 4,600 schools. So with the experience of the project management in Liberia, my company, um, my head office, which is in the U.S., thought that I would be a good fit for this, Mm -hmm. and so here I am. Mm. And so how how, how did that work out with your husband in Liberia? Well, he had to come. (laughs) There are times when, there are times when, I think this is, is, that's an interesting question, because you meet a lot of other spouses and mm-hmm. almost 80 to 90 percent of the time mm-hmm. the wife is what we would call the trailing spouse yeah. so it's the wife that um that um follows the husband so to speak yes so um in this case he's the trailing spouse <laughs> but um, this is something we spoke about yeah. <laughs> this is something of course we spoke yeah. about before yes um, the good thing is that um, based on the type of work he does, mm-hmm. he's still able to work at a distance. Okay. Um, and it's, I guess, one of those things that a uh, couple, mm-hmm. um, you just have to do. Yes. He does go home from time to time mm-hmm. just to check on family because um, my mother-in-law, his mom is still there. Mm-hmm. Um, and yeah, but he's here with me nine out of the 12 months of the year the other mm. three I reluctantly give them up so he can go check on uh, <laughs> my mother and yes. all. <laughs> but she comes as well she does okay. visit from time to time which is also good yes all right. So I'm just pulling up my map of Africa, you know, because uh, I have it in my head because so you were in Ghana and then to Liberia and then Zambia. So it's different parts of, of, of Africa. Um, well, t- right. So Zambia, Zambia. Um, d- describe that for us in terms of the difference. Um, most of us can can relate to to Ghana, um, if not Liberia, but definitely mm-hmm. to Ghana. Um, how does Zambia mm-hmm. differ from 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 Ghana, for example? Um, they are they are similar. Mm-hmm. Um, both, as you know, had been under British colonial rule, so there are mm-hmm. some structures that are still quite similar. But I do think that the historical experience in the southern part of Africa is very different from the western part of Africa. Mm-hmm. Um, that, is it, is was it, once a part of. Yeah, go ahead. Sorry. No, go, go ahead. I was interrupting a bit, but go ahead. Mm-hmm. I was going to say Zambia was once a part of Rhodesia, mm-hmm. and so there is that history of apartheid that mm-hmm. was more common in the southern part of Africa mm-hmm. versus, uh, and not so much in the western part of Africa, so to speak. Mm-hmm. So that was um, that's something very different. Mm-hmm. Um, its levels of development are very similar to to um, Ghana. Mm -hmm. Uh, Usual challenges that I think most countries, including Jamaica, face Mm -hmm. 
mm-hmm. in terms of um, whether or not it's health, whether or not it's education. So there are still some of those. Mm-hmm. I do like Zambia because Zambia is peaceful. Mm-hmm. It's one of the few places that I don't feel... I don't feel like I have to keep looking over my shoulder every mm-hmm. minute. Mm-hmm. Um, I will get up at 5.30 and go for my morning walk. Mm-hmm. And the most someone will say to me, good morning. Um. I still remember when I moved, I was asking co-workers, but is it okay for me to be out at this time? Is it okay for me to mm-hmm. be out by myself as a woman? And they said, yeah, man. Mm-hmm. I mean, Lusaka is, Lusaka is known for its peacefulness. Mm. And I do like that. Yeah. I really like that about, um, I can probably count on one hand the amount of uh, negative news in terms of murders or anything mm-hmm, mm-hmm. that I've heard since my nearly two years here. And you notice so even for I us... I find it to be a very peaceful country. And even for us, we don't get much news out of Zambia at all because you know how the Western media covers news from Africa. If it's negative, you're getting it, so you hardly mm-hmm. hear anything coming out of out of Zambia and so that explains it um you, you are you, you're yep. Zambia is bordered by um Zimbabwe on one side um uh, Malawi is on the other so there is mm-hmm. right there's Botswana as well when you mm-hmm. go down to Livingston if you go right you will go to Zim <laughs> if you go left you will go to Botswana yeah um yes Angola so Lux- Democratic Lux- Republic of Congo. yeah wow um I remember yeah Mm-hmm. I was just about to say, I remember going somewhere for work and the road that I was on, Congo was on one side. <laughs> side. How do you feel? Yeah, no, honestly, right. Denise, how do you feel? Side. How does that make you feel? Because I can't imagine being in Africa and I have Angola on one side. I'm just going to work and Angola is over there. So, and Congo is over there and Malawi there. You know, you, and you turn your back and you're in Zimbabwe. I mean, that must be phenomenal for you. Do you stop at any time to say, wow, wow? All the time, oh. all the time. I mean, mm-hmm. I, I, definitely, I definitely count my blessings. Mm-hmm. I, I remember, life is funny, you know. I remember mm-hmm. as a child growing up, um, when I started high school, I remember I, t- I told my mother, I said to her, I wanted to do French. Mm-hmm. Said, child, go sit down, Spanish. <laughs> South yeah. America down the bottom, Cuba over the corner. Yeah. The Spanish, it will serve you by Francophone countries, yes. and you made me do Spanish. <laughs> <laughs> but, but it is. Uh, yes. <laughs> it is. It is. Yeah. Sometimes it feels a little bit surreal, mm-hmm. and I mean, I think being, I think having been able to live in different regions, mm-hmm. um, well, first west, now south, and mm-hmm. I've, I've also done work in Eastern Africa, even though I haven't lived there. Yes. I think I appreciate better mm-hmm. just what um, just what each country has. Yeah. And I don't for a minute think that I've managed to scratch even more than the surface in yeah. terms of Ghana or Liberia or even now Zambia. Mm-hmm. But it does make me appreciate and I want to learn more about mm-hmm about each country's history. Mm-hmm. And I think that's one thing that I was a little bit, I was reflecting on the other day. Mm-hmm. I can recite all of the English history. I did history at UA, I did history in sixth form. Mm-hmm. But that was English history or America in the Caribbean. History. Yeah. Never really took a lot of time in terms of looking at African history mm-hmm. and now I find myself doing that a bit more. Wow. So mm-hmm. even before moving to Zambia, I wanted to read more about the history. I wanted to understand where they were coming from. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, and and that's something I like to do whenever I have to go for work. Mm-hmm. Um, that's something I make the extra time to do. When I'm in the country, mm-hmm. another thing that I like to make the time to do is to try the local food. Mm-hmm. I always try and go to a nightclub because then I want to hear what the music and how people behave and yes. try the local beer. Those yeah, are yeah. my top things. <laughs> <laughs> Just to be able to get a yes. sense of... Um, yeah, what but, makes things... But, I hear, but I hear that you make Jamaican patties and all them things there in the Zambia. Listen to who teach you, Denise? Honestly, who, t- who taught you? <laughs> the other day, I was just dying for some patties. So I said, but 
why not make it? Mm. You know, I think I'm a relatively good cook. Yes. And so I whip up a batch. Mm. And I I have a couple of Caribbean friends here, um, mm. Jamaican, well, at least one Jamaican, mm -hmm. um, lots of Trinidadians. We have someone from, we have two people from Haiti. So we're mm -hmm. all a part of a WhatsApp group. Mm -hmm. So I took pictures of the patties. And the next thing I know is that I was getting order for patties. So yes, ma'am. I, I have a patty in Zambia. The official Jamaican <laughs> patty shop yeah. right in Alasaka. <laughs> <laughs> And oh, I even uh, expanded my repertoire. Yes. I made cocoa bread the other day. Ah, uh -huh. yes. No, 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 no. No, I don't, no, I'm not, no, I'm not playing with you at all. No, no playing <laughs> on it. <laughs>
Mm-hmm. And I think the first thing would be to do your homework um, properly before you come. Mm-hmm. Um, Zambia, for example, doesn't, um, you don't need a visa. You don't, I'm, by the way, in all of this, I still have my Jamaican passport. Yeah. I, don't, I don't have no dual nationality. You're moving, around, like, you're moving around on your Jamaican, Jamaican passport. passport. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. Of course. <laughs> um, and so you don't need a visa to come yeah. to Zambia. Mm-hmm. You will have a limited time, of course. They normally would give you, if memory serves me correct, about a month. Mm-hmm. But I would say do your homework first. If there are business opportunities, make sure you find someone, as you would in any other country, that you can trust in terms of beginning some initial exploration. Mm-hmm. And finances allowing, try it, you know. Um, come see it for what it is. Mm-hmm. Um, I had two Jamaicans who were stuck here with me during COVID, and they really liked it. One mm-hmm. was from Jamaica. Mm-hmm. Um, he had come up to look at some business opportunities. The other, she is Jamaican, but living in um, Guinea-Bissau, she had come over to visit, and they both really liked it. And okay. I think, yeah. I think there is enough information online um, if you're looking for leads in terms of what is feasible, and Mm -hmm. that's probably your first thing. You Mm -hmm. have to be able to research, to be able to make some more, to make informed decisions about coming. Mm -hmm. I think me coming with my company was Mm -hmm. a little bit easier, of course, because um, we do have the project locally, as I said, and so they took care of a lot of the a lot of the other pieces in terms Mm -hmm. of legal pieces that needed to be taken care of. And how important is it? after... Yeah, go ahead. Sorry? No, sorry. Go ahead. How important is it for for persons who are coming to live in Africa? You've been on the continent um, for so many years now. To to, to see Africa and to treat Africa through the lenses of Africa and not through um, a, a preconceived idea of what Africa should be, but to understand where you are um, to understand the system you're living in and to, to see Africa through Africa's lens? Well, I, I would like to think that as Jamaicans, we would expect that anybody coming to Jamaica would try and see Jamaica as we as Jamaicans see it as well, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. Um, and I think I think the least we can do is afford... Um, the various countries the same courtesy of being able to see their individual country through their eyes. And Mm -hmm. I think a part of that is understanding the culture, understanding the customs, being respectful of the customs. Mm -hmm. I remember in Ghana, I could hit my teeth any (laughs) time. I can just go and hit my teeth. Yes. Here, if I hit my teeth, I probably will be deported. Oh, you see Because it is one of the biggest offenses ever. Oh, you know? so and understanding the culture, yes. Exactly. It mm-hmm. is those little nuances mm-hmm. that mm-hmm. I think make the difference. Mm-hmm. And I think people will genuinely be interested if they see that you are... You won't find Jamaica in Zambia, but there will be other things about Zambia that will, of course, make me appreciate Jamaica more. But there are also other things about Zambia that I will appreciate more. And I think I think that's the that's the piece that's important. Um, I think too many times we, especially in terms of Western media, mm-hmm. we tend to paint all of the countries in the same color. We yeah. tend to make these assumptions across the board. Mm-hmm. And as I said before, for each of the countries, you just find something that is so unique and so different that you begin to appreciate even more. And I think that's a part of the journey, eh? Yes, to obviously. Discover, mm-hmm. discover the place. Mm-hmm. And while discovering the place, hopefully also discover something else about yourself. Wow. And I think that's an important part of anybody's journey. Wow, Denise, you've just motivated so many of us. I can feel the energy. I'm seeing people writing into me, just talk, giving all kinds of messages while you're on. So the motivation really this morning, um, high, high levels of motivation. 
Thank you so much for that. I'm, I'm extremely motivated for, um, by you two, just listening to the journey through the continent of Africa and the fact that you're, you're there and, 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 and sounding as if it's all in the party alone. Make me feel like, say, yes, it can work. The jerk chicken and, the, and, and so on and so, <laughs> and so forth. The Jamaican no, parties on the ground. I feel, I feel for our chef, come join me so we can open up the official party shop. So no, I want. I want. Did you hear that, I want? <laughs> Did you hear that appeal from Zambia? <laughs> we need to open an official party <laughs> shop. <laughs> yeah, man. Serious business. The next thing I'm going to tackle is yeah. some actual food. You and, know, I want again. I want <laughs> actual <laughs> food. <laughs> No, we're going to have to make this work. We're going to have to make this work. We're loving it. All right. Thank you so much, Denise. But the only reason why we're going is because we're completely out of time. I told you this would have happened, you know. So we're completely out of time. Do you, yeah, you, yeah, you want to yeah. say hello to anyone quickly? Of course. I want to say hi to my mother. Oh, Lord. You know what? This reminds me of now, you know, when you watch those Jamaican Christmas Of greetings. course, That's yes. <laughs> greetings from I Canada. I want to say hello to my mother, <laughs> yes. um, Iris Clark. Uh, she's in your town, and Catherine, my sister Stacy, who is my rock and my strength, my brothers Wayne and Taj, my sweetheart, my daughter Ashley, uh -huh. and of course all my family and friends. And um, thank you, Kabu. Thank you for thank you reaching so out. Much. Thanks yeah. for this interview. Um, it was good to be able to share. So thank and, you very and much. We, thank you. Thank you, Denise. And we'll keep in touch. Remember, we're working on a documentary together. <laughs> Sound like a plan. Yeah, All we, right. we'll definitely keep in touch, my sister. Take care. Yeah, man. All Bye right. for now. Okay. Running African, reuniting the African family for development. Did you know that Jazz is getting married on Sunday? Oh, yes. Yes. Oh, my daughter. Yeah. I didn't tell you. No. no. Okay. I'm inviting you all to my wedding. Yes, 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 this is how we're saying goodbye for today. Uh, <laughs> we'll see you next week, inshallah. Thank you to everyone who participated. I'm still on a high from that interview with Denise, you know. Boy, Africa sounding better all the time. Sounding better all the time. A quick appeal before we go to the authorities that um, we have no water in Marlborough, Hopewell, in St. Mary. No water in the lines. I'm making an appeal, please, to the authorities. Dr. Guy, the National Water Commission, somebody, um, for persons, elderly persons, for persons who are ill, it really is a problem. There's water on the line. The pipeline is blocked. And this is happening over and over and over and over and over again. Please, get some water to Hopewell, Marlborough, St. Mary. Thank you. This is how we say goodbye, making way for the big A inside of this Sunday sunshine. My name is Kabu, Kabu Ma'at Kiru. On behalf of my broadcast assistant, Shamara Preston, and who's at the desk, Jody Kay. We'll see you next week, inshallah.